If you could be a real cool governor what cares about people and does things to make stuff better instead of complains about everything. Complaining? Cool, yeah, me and complaining man. totally awesome. You know, being governor has its advantages. You'd be quite powerful. Oh, really? And I could just put all my friends in charge of everything and just rape and pillage the economy and line my pockets with money and go bad with power? You actually could do that. This LTX-71 concealable mic is part of the same system that NASA used when they faked the Apollo moon landings. Worked for them. Shouldn't give us too many problems. They break and enter. How are we doing? Cars in position on the fire escape. Mothers in the cable vault. Carrying to sever master circuit. But they're not thieves. We're getting too old for this. They know your secrets. But they're not spies. Gotta be there somewhere. What's he doing? Like, no, really? Mr. Bishop, do you mind if I take a look? Carl. Grow up. I give you something to work, baby. So people hire you to break into their places to make sure no one can break into their places? It's a living. Not a very good one. Now they've got a new client. National Security Agency. I don't work for the government. Relax, Marty. It's just everybody on your team has had some sort of problem in their past. Now what are you saying? The NSA killed Kennedy? No. They shot him, but they didn't kill him. He's still alive. They may not want the job. Liz, I need your help. I will not be dragged back into your world. But they don't have a choice. We don't want to bust you. We want to hire you. We're the good guys, Marty. Can't tell you what a relief that is. Dick, your job is to find that little black box. We got it. Holy cow. It's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. Anybody want to shut down the Federal Reserve? Hey, don't wait, screw wait, around wait, with that thing. Wait. It's all about the information. So it's a code breaker. No, it's the code breaker. Battle stations, do you have the item? Can you guarantee my safety? Where is the item? Can you guarantee my safety? Martin, you've got trouble. Here, maybe this might help. An old buddy of mine who was in Desert Storm sent it to me. Of course, he was on the other side. Now give me the bomb! Marty! I'm an excellent marksman, woman. I'm Carl. There's a fire escape at the end of the North Corridor. Go directly north, directly north, about 30 yards. Five seconds. Hang up, Fish! Hang up, they've almost got us. I am totally recording. <gasps> the episode no! may have started, may not man? have started. Go ahead. This is going to be used to blackmail me, damn it. Yeah, like I said, I've got tapes of everyone. I'm like Nixon that way. Oh, damn it. <laughs> to be fair, LBJ was doing it too. Yeah. Nixon if was a, just stupid enough to be caught. If a podcaster <laughs> does it, it's not illegal. And you damn hippies, I, I got to use you as a scapegoat. Damn you, damn you, damn you. Um, Speaking of scapegoats, oh. we've got lots <laughs> of them in this movie. I think we should probably get this this part out of the way before tangents ensue. This is, as you can tell if you've been here before, and if you haven't been here before, you downloaded the thing so you know what's going on. This is another oh, psychosemantic shit. podcast. I'm here we with... We can't talk about that. Damn it. <laughs> Cam Sully... J-U-R-S podcast, thank you for having me. Uh, all that fun stuff. Not to be confused with the Jack You Off show on Pornhub. But yeah, that's that's for the Patreon. Al- allegedly. Only fans, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and other dirty things for money happen in 1992's Sneakers, directed and written by Phil Alden Robinson, who is connected to shit like... Field of Dreams and ended his career after being hassled by dickhead uh, Tom Clancy on the set of Some All Fears. So it began his descent and uh, which he later ended. And unfortunately, because you look at all his other stuff, there's uh, there's nothing wrong. Fletch. 
I saw all his right, so there you go. I mean, on that. Uh, I used to watch that movie all the time. When oh I was yeah, a kid. that's a good one. I, I heard you just say Fletch, so I thought stupid Chevy Chase movie. Okay, oh, my bad. Oh yeah. no. Well, yeah, Fletch, Fletch also, but before that was all of me. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the one you're talking. That that is a very underrated role for both Tomlin and Martin. So yeah. Um this is definitely a good movie because this was one of those you would see on cable and you wouldn't always necessarily remember everything that happened in it. It was very slow moving. You had to be in the right you had to set a, aside time for it. I was so glad I rewatched it for this and because I mean I'd I've been meaning to rewatch it for years because it was just always don't quote me on this, but I, I've seen so and just spare. Yeah, there's plenty of quoting on this damn thing, and it doesn't matter. It's on tape, but uh, on sparse occasions, I've I've seen small articles kind of noting how it's kind of been referenced in parts of pop culture. This movie is essentially kind of the now you see me, you know, Ocean's Eleven of its day, and that it, it just has all these elements that it has to balance out. It has to be, you know, it's a it's a spy heist movie, and it's mixing in you know political thriller uh uh undertones a mystery um uh, some off-color comedy and some mild action to finish it all off so i mean it's a milkshake like a tarantino movie that you can't put in just one category because why would you there's, there's no point it's got something for everybody um i uh, when you saw this movie did you i mean yeah, you'd have to be a liar to say you got it all in one scoop. I mean, there, there's so many other subplots that you're not going to get pick up right away or fo- know who to follow who originally that the characters are following. So I think I'm glad you picked this movie because, I mean, you've tackled so many other, you know, horror and sci-fi movies with just uh, fucked up look at society and other stuff. And this one was pretty cool because, I mean, it's just rewarding for many different uh, scenarios. It was kind of like 91's company business, the Gene Hackman um, uh, um, action comedy, where it's just, it was one of those Cold War type tribute spy movies that flew under the radar. You know, it just wasn't making Hunt for Red October money, but it, it was kind of a big deal at the day and age because, I mean, I, I read up that this is one of the first movies where they did an electronic press kit, making it look like a dossier kind of file. <laughs> I thought that was really movie. cool. So I, I could, uh, yeah, uh, as a floppy disk, I'm like, that's great. So, I mean, if anything, this movie encouraged them future marketing. And uh, apparently it did make money. And I, I would see it constantly advertised as uh, being on USA Network. Apparently NBC was going to do a show about that. That was weird to read. Um, apparently audiences liked it. It got an A- minus from Cinema Score. So, I mean, shit. I mean, uh <laughs> It hit home with somebody. I mean, that's good. Um, uh, but fucked up wise, I, what I was going to say to you before the show is like, I would not be surprised if some dickhead on Parlor or somebody decided to just have this be a free to stream movie as a, see, this is how the Dems hack the 2000 elections. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I hope that's not fucking true. <laughs> but I'm sure somewhere out there, I, I think this movie is too complex for their fucking heads. Not that they have much of a head. <laughs> they think yeah. with their dicks, not their head. So, I mean, <laughs> different kind of head. But it's just so wild how it's like and this has just so many other just wacky elements. It's so wild seeing Timothy Buzzfield, a uh, thirty-something and West Wing fame, in here as one of the henchmen of Ben Kingsley. Ben Kingsley is even an atypical guy, just with the whole "give me back the box," you know, because that's the whole thing. That's always been the whole symbolism that uh, any secret that you can't have, it's all in a box somewhere stowed away. <laughs> And, and I guess literally, a, it is a box. It, it is a black box. It is the device. It is the Maltese Falcon of this movie. Uh, the Maltese Falcon <laughs> segue is the Pulp Fiction. It's it's kind of a cyberpunk movie, but minus like the hacking's not even the main stage point. It's the whole you get to meet the big boss, and it's not about defeating him so much as tricking him, and everyone gets what they want, and everyone gets out alive. <laughs> but that's what drew me to this when I first saw it when I was little was thinking it was really fucking cool what uh i mean shit sydney portier uh yeah, Robert yeah, redford yeah. dan Aykroyd as a guy i i will always watch him well not always but i <laughs> i appreciate <laughs> when a character shares the same name as i have even if it's spelled oh. differently so anybody named darren which isn't a very common name in movies 
there's like a, the kid who gets in trouble and gets sent to the principal's office. But no, around here there's oh, like yeah. uh, three three of us drummers in the punk scene, all named Darren. So oh nice. There was a lot of which Darren, you know, as drummers can be. There's lots of multiple bands, but I would find Stephen Tobolowski right? is in this movie. And that was so unexpected. I saw him in the opening credits, and then when he popped up at the front desk when they're finally getting the heist underway, it's like, oh, okay, and there he is. <laughs> One day at a time. The Literally. skeezy um, <laughs> Werner Brandis. Shall I phone yeah. you or nudge you? Werner Brandis. <laughs> and this is kind of wild, though. Going back to Pointy A and Redford, how this just plays on their earlier roles. I mean... Redford, you know, we often think of heist and spy stuff like Condor and, uh, you know, Butch Cassidy. But, I mean, people also forget he's done other good heist and movies like, you know, The Sting, The Hot Rock. And, of course, spy films like Spy Game later on. That was a fun tribute. So, I mean, this is interesting here because this is the in-between point of any of those movies. And it's just a surprise hit. And I also think it's interesting how, you know, Pointier, of course, also was just... Uh, enough cannot be said of how fantastic he is in everything, you know, adapting plays. And he's already done minor spy accomplishments and war movies like the Bedford incident, which, you know, if you see that now, you'll see totally how it inspired every other submarine kind of movie like does boot and definitely red October. And, you know, this is interesting here because, you know, this is when Redford's trying to balance out, career with you know sundance before he gives it up and just says uh it's no better than all the rest of the corporates you know know, companies and and so this is interesting here just seeing him balance out the movie and then try and give equal screen time to everybody i I love how so many of the actors starred in other films with each other like mary mcdonald who plays as a strained wife here you know had been in several movies with the hacker david straitharn you know they both work with indie filmmakers john styles to name a few so and, you know, straight iron, of course, later is in spy type stuff like Alphas in the Bourne series. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, I never really thought of this as an Ocean's Eleven type movie until this recent rewatch. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I definitely I, I would not. I was actually going to say this to you before. I would not be surprised if Steven Soderbergh saw this movie and said, I'm going to base the rest of my fil- filmography off of this fucking movie. You know, even Haywire and. <laughs> all some of the other stuff he did before he and George Clooney went separate ways. And it's like, yeah, you know, I see what you're doing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is definitely the perfect backstory for when the nineties carries on into the two thousands and that, and where movies are just not afraid to be a little, just atypical. And by atypical, I don't mean like alternative entertainment. That's conservatives love to say, I mean more just like, just, we're going to take a chance and we got enough star power. So you got to let us do what we need to do. Trust us. And uh, it's very interesting just seeing how this just plays out because I mean, there's just so many even sections to it. No one is who they seem to be. It, it, I, I'm surprised there wasn't an uncredited rewrite by David Mamet, but see David Mamet would have done what, you know, Aaron Sorkin does where, you know, everyone talks and it's never just a monologue and it's, it's so damn good. You let them get away with it. But I mean here, I mean, everybody's just very quick and to the point and you know that whatever they're saying has like an alternative meaning or I uh, mean something more before they let on to the next scene It makes good uses of montages and, you know, and when I when I was in film school, everyone hated, you know, just montages, especially some of my professors. And see, I'm fine with montages. I mean, European filmmaking has dictated it for so long that it works. Documentaries do it. And I mean, even Homicide Life on the Street popularized that even more. So I was like, I, I see no problem in using a montage. If it's going to be too much or the scenes are going to feel dragged out, just cut to the next scene. I don't, you know, like. When Redford even gets knocked out here, you know, we, we instantly see the dark room instantly as opposed to, you know, see the henchmen shove them in every area of the car and drive to wherever, you know, it's just things are kept in the dark until you need to know them. And because you're figuring out it could lead so many other ways, you, you have enough interest to be built up and go on. So, I mean, it's definitely very sad to see that this is one of River Phoenix's final roles. It's like, damn. <laughs> he's so great here because 
not even the main character. No ego about that kid. He's just perfect. <laughs> yeah, and he's he's good in that way. Like in um, uh, what is it? I love you to death. Yes, yeah, very, uh, a very underrated cast in dark comedy and does not get enough love. Uh, I, I actually saw the director's uh, AFI special that of him talking about is like no one understood it. And he's like, I'm making a dark comedy. here. <laughs> <laughs> I what thought it was fuck? great. I saw it in early. It high was school, good. I, I mean, uh, I have even told all my friends who think Keanu Reeves cannot act. I'm like, no, fuck you. Watch him in that. Watch him in the watcher. Watch him in Street Kings. He can act. <laughs> You're just. You were being way too easy when you do the whole, oh, he doesn't have to do much in John Wick and the Matrix, and he's terrible in Dracula. I'm like, okay, but have you seen all these other ten roles? Okay, then let's stop having this conversation. You're just being, you're embarrassing yourself here. And well, I'm not going to watch him anyway. He's like, John okay, Wick. so. <laughs> right? That shit's I mean, well, <laughs> oh, but even before that with Street Kings, he had to play a role where he's playing an officer who's done crooked things and realizes, wow. I can't keep doing this, and this person is actually trying to kill me and do a total cover up. And I mean, I mean, even before that, I mean, the Watcher he had to play a serial killer who thought he was doing God's work, basically, you know. And so, going back to this, I mean, I love you to death. I mean, is a perfect example of, uh, you know, taking a chance on an all star cast of talented people and. Uh, it's just so cool how River got to be the lead as well as just supporting most of the time and just still it. I uh, I mean, people can sing the praises of his brother walking, what they like about it. I, I'm sorry, River is the where it's at, you know, because <laughs> there's plenty of actors who died way too young. And I, I don't think we even saw the best stuff that Brandon Lee had to offer. But with River, he was very much to me like with uh, Raul Julia, where – he just really bit into every single role. You can't say that he even played the same character in every movie, you know, <laughs> running on empty stand by me, you know, own private Idaho also with Keanu. So it's like he, I mean, even the beginning of Indiana Jones and last crusade was always a cool thing. It's like, you know what? That was a perfect different version of, you know, Indy that I didn't even know was in that kind of character depiction. So, I mean, he, it's definitely one of those incidents where you had to basically, you know, at, at this time and day, you know, so this came out in 92. That's a big year for film. You know, we're embracing the Hong Kong scene and other foreign films and art house stuff, embracing, you know, home video and movie channels. So different types of alternative music, the underground scene still in there. So, I mean, that's a big year. I'm surprised this did well because so many movies did not do well because of the 92 LA riots and a lot of them even went to direct video and just took the hit. So, I mean, um, uh, it's so interesting how this one came in. It's kind of talked about, but it's not always known amongst many people. And yet, uh, so river died in 93 he was 23. So he would have been 22 here. I take it. So, <laughs> and so that this is definitely interesting in that everybody gets screen time and everybody gets to do something. And the movie is mysterious enough that if you were to make it today, it would just fucking suck. I mean, <laughs> yes, it, yes, you, you can say you can compare it to now you see me and Ocean's Eleven type stuff. But I mean, those movies, they're definitely inspired by this kind of movie, but they're also their own kind of gimmick and formula. All the same, I, I think if you did something like this, someone would just want to play it too safe or add a plot twist that wasn't needed or be too much like all the other spy movies. Now today, you got to make it like James Bond, Taken, or Born Identity. You know, you can't... How dare you come up with an original spy movie that, you know, doesn't have one explosion, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't use that much oboe in a soundtrack these days. Oh, or or yeah. whatever was the woodwind that just sort of danced over most of the scenes before. right <laughs> there, there was some atypical never a consistent instrument in this damn movie and that's what was even more interesting that kind of just showed you how they're peeling off different layers you know uh the place that you think is a house is actually the place where they're all crashing in another scene <laughs> and then um uh, uh i mean 
uh, this is before we had the today's kind of wiretapping and everything. And I like how they, you know, because it's set in like, they said it was set in 69 initially. And then I think it moves on to some other uh, decades later, I think. But uh, I love the old fashioned uh, uh, moment where they're realizing they're being traced. And it's like they, they got to cut off the phone. And it's like, but. It's done in such a way where it actually ends the scene instead of just being one of many segments. Is like it's done as a transition kind of before they reveal the next stage of their plan. <laughs> there's, there's, it's a series of heists, absolutely, uh, uh, which is fun and things that just sort of flow easier for the I think the child viewer. But there's so much behind it, or at least history of that style behind it that it. Uh, I mean, I have always liked this movie. This is a movie that I'll throw it on when I'm editing a episode or something like that. On really? The, on occasion. Okay, yeah. nice. It's, it's just one of those movies that's... I don't always sit down and watch it, but it is definitely one of those movies. Yeah, if it's on the movie channels, I'll definitely put it on. Um, uh, especially after this. I got to get the Blu-ray or see if it's in a <laughs> double pack with something, you know? Um uh, I think it's interesting too, like, like you say, how it it is kind of a movie that I think you could introduce to anybody. You could, if you introduce this to some gamers, they would find it pretty fascinating, and that says a lot for a movie that doesn't require many close-ups of hacking. You know, no swordfish type stuff here. You know, this is all uh, or other junky kind of stupid stuff. Like there's. People's, you know, Dan Aykroyd's in here, but he's being atypical than his usual self, you know, Harold Ramis collaborations. You, you know what I mean? Like, if you do that nowadays, oh, death to your career. How dare you, Kevin Hart or uh, whatever overrated comedian isn't doing what I want uh, you to do, which is something absolutely stupid. You know, it's just like, how dare you? You know, <laughs> you've gone outside the formula. We got to kill your career. And, you know, it's stuff like that. And so it's like, it's wild to hear how basically... This movie is had enough freedom to uh, essentially just uh, do a few different um, uh, just uh, it's playing around with different formulas, but it's also it's pretty straightforward if you actually want to connect the dots. And then it's just the rest of it is just figuring out the exact, you know, who's trying to betray who or blackmail who. <laughs> um it's also rare because, like I say, I think if you did this movie nowadays, they would want to have just a bloodbath instead of actually just uh, just continually go for a surprise. And maybe Christopher Nolan watched this way too much and decided, I got to add five twists too many because <laughs> I'm still the second coming of Hitchcock and De Palma or whatever. <laughs> I was actually surprised at the language in this. Oh my god! I heard Sydney Poitier say "motherfucker" at one point. I swear, was I the only one? I'm pretty sure what near near the end uh, when uh, yeah near the end yeah. during the chase when Straithorn is crashing the car. I swear I heard "motherfucker" say, and so I was like, "Wow, PG-13." He, he either did or he said it, and they uh, overdubbed Mumbled it. But it you know, bit. but you know what he said, or yeah, "mother jam." It could be like a Danny Glover thing. You mother jammer. <laughs> Getting too over this shit. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's right when he's cocking the shotgun, right? I think so. And he knocks out a henchman. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll split your head. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 there are some... Another thing I didn't notice until I was paying attention to it so I could talk about it <gasps> instead of just You paid attention? It. Oh my God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a Whistler, when talking about the trace, I never noticed that Whistler said it's going to be the hardest trace they ever heard. Right? Because it's Whistler. <laughs> yeah. But don't, don't. <laughs> they were straight there. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, again, anyone who says they got it all in one scoop, I worked on the screenplay, which was by the, uh, part of the duo who originally conducted it a decade earlier while working on war games. I can watch war games, but I, I, I never really get much from it. It's just light hearted entertainment. This one it's lighthearted, but it, it does leave you with a lot of things is just, uh, and just how nothing is ever straightforward, you know, whether it's the mission or just this outrageous heist, let alone how 
I mean, you can call them anti-heroes, but they're not dicks like today's anti-heroes typically are portrayed as, you know, where, oh, I killed someone, but they were a pedophile. And it's like, no, here, none of them have to kill anybody. But they also are willing to, again, just keep playing games when the NSA comes knocking at the final 10 minutes of the movie. You know, (laughs) it's interesting how they they know how to get what they need. And at the same time how to uh, overthink without, especially when, you know, they go through practically plan A, B, and C, and then they end up having to conduct plan D through F. You know what I mean? (laughs) They have to basically, okay, well, that went to shit, but we're not going to gloat or do the whole overacting going, no, what do I do? It's like, they're they're not running around like chickens with their heads cut off. (laughs) This is before Enemy of the State, where everybody is running from every house, changing every outfit very fast. You know? <laughs> Fugitive on the run. Uh, <laughs> I will no, spend, no Harrison I gotta Ford. Run. Absolutely. Or my wife, my family. No, no Harrison Ford. <laughs> there's a wife and there's a family, but in this case, the wife is here unexpectedly <laughs> in the mission and gets uh, Mary McDonald gets some great stuff here. <laughs> James Earl and Jones. Too. Yeah, I, I, I. I I think at one point I, I had seen him uh, included in here and they do a good job of making it very secret. It's like, no, he's in the movie, I, but I didn't see his name in the opening credits. I think they reserved it for like the very end of the movie. So, Oh yeah. I could be wrong. Uh, no, I, I feel that it, it, <laughs> I've seen it. So I, I, I saw it so long ago that I hadn't really thought about the promotion of, cause movie. I mean, you, right. He's not even on the poster, and that's fine, because, I mean, uh, but it's also a, a surprise that pays off, and it's not just something where it's like, the cake is a lie kind of thing. It's like, no, this is what's going on, and this was this and that, and, you know, anyone who can sum this up in one sentence, it, again, there's no way. <laughs> there's so many different things, um, and, I mean, uh, it, it is wild how... Uh, they, they continually acknowledge how they didn't realize what one stupid mistake would cost them and how they're constantly having just used to going under the radar. At the same time, it does a good job of just saying, you know, it's like it doesn't literally have to be underground. You know, it's, fuck all that Die Hard with a Vengeance Dark Knight shit. No, this is all actually you know, just very configured. Uh, everybody has a code. You know how, like, when everyone has a secret password or something that they say, like, hey, let's go to the movies, you know, (laughs) just, hey, uh, uh, Diana's cooking something, you know, and when you're trying to leave a party or uh, everyone has some kind of word that you only the group of friends know what they mean. And it, it definitely applies here to their, you know, job, which is also happens to be basically their life at this point in stage in of their existence. I like Crease and mother, their story throughout the, the movie. Uh, Potier and Ackroyd. Yeah. 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 And Ackroyd, especially cause I mean, he, he's looking at all, all, all the spying equipment and I love how they argue who's going to get pizza. <laughs> Double check it. Um, uh, did you expect to see uh, Donald Logue here as the mathematician at the, uh, main first espionage portion of the movie. This was like one of the first movies he did. So I feel like he, after this, I didn't really notice him again until what was it? Yeah, because by that show point, he had Grounded for Life, I think. Grounded was, for Life was his and, next appearance on my radar. Uh, do you remember him as the main henchman in Blade? Yeah, and uh, I feel like he was on Sons of Anarchy. I don't know how many episodes he was on but i feel like i saw uh, him let's... involved in that yeah you're right i i didn't i need to re- re-review the rest of the part when i start doing cult tv uh and i just stack a bunch of similar shows all together but yeah apparently he was on er and he's really been still in the show lately on svu and gotham and vikings and he was on the show copper apparently for a season so there you go but uh he was on a very hysterical sitcom that was kind of the Steven Bochco's version of Barney Miller called Public Morals. You can watch two episodes of that on YouTube. But yeah, he's 
he's definitely a go-to guy. You, everyone's seen him in some fashion where it's stupid shit like Ghost Rider or The Patriot or better stuff like, um, you know, the Tayo Steve and Thin Red Line and even uh, Disclosure, which is definitely a must-see movie, just addressing just workplace blackmail and and the unethical people who we're having to feel sorry for who got themselves in the shitty situations in the first place. So, I mean, oh, uh, that, that's the Demi Moore, Michael Douglas movie, right? Absolutely. And it was one of those, they could not get it past. Oh, they've been in all these similar movies. It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. This, this is a Levinson movie. Fuck what Mike Douglas has done before this. You know, this, this is not an erotic movie. It, it, you, you look at Roger Ebert's review and it's like, Thanks, Ebert. I love you to death. You've written many a good reviews, and thank you for missing the whole fucking point of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Several times in that movie, he uh, review, he addresses how he didn't see what he thought they should have shown. I'm like, <laughs> that Levinson even said alone, what you don't see is what makes it more powerful. And in, in this case, I mean, this is definitely what's said about sneakers here. What, what you don't see is perfect. You, you get the whole gist of it, and it kind of, it's not a horror movie by any stretch, but it does kind of just build on that whole, man, that's, <laughs> this is such a amusing look at what's otherwise a very depressing, you know, on the run kind of a movie. <laughs> and, um, I love how they have to steal from the toy company. <laughs> I did have to retract for this, like, wait, they're not just stealing from anything. They're stealing from a damn toy company <laughs> that's linked to various thing one that's connected to thing two and connected to all things free through 10, you know, it's just that it, it definitely knows how to compact all this information without doing mem- information overload and say, Whoa, 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 shut the front door, take a step back, re-explain, you know, and they never even have to re-explain themselves. They basically <laughs> just go from one point to the next point and make it enough to where even if you don't get the entire gist, you know what they're doing. You know, and so you can be the biggest fucking idiot and you'll still get the gist of this. You know what I mean? (laughs) Give him head whenever he likes. (laughs) Jesus. Yeah. But yeah, not to break up your your poignant uh, moment. (laughs) With all these other in the window. I mean, I mean, this movie could have had off color stuff and it would have worked, too. I mean, it is the kind of movie. I mean, it it could have been as edgy as it needed to be. And it kind of knew how to be edgy without being atypical. I mean, atypical. And it's interesting how uh, I mean, there's uh, there's so many segments, but you never feel like uh, the various tones of the movie are out of place. You never feel like wait a second no there's no way that could connect to this <laughs> and i mean if you were to rewatch this you wouldn't really even notice any plot holes you would actually just the plot would make better sense the plot makes overall sense but you're gonna what i mean by that is you're gonna pick up on the exact key details like oh that's right he did this and that and like you said before there were some other inside jokes that you didn't understand didn't get right away and uh noticing that when they're referring to the character, you didn't realize, oh, but that's their nickname. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I do like how they give them enough to do. And now, if you did this now, they would probably recast it with a bunch of talented actors and a bunch of other actors who are good, but never really pick anything that's actually good to put on their resume. <laughs> so I'm looking at you, uh, you know, Bradley Cooper or Drisselba. <laughs> Fuck you guys. <laughs> wasting my money on your movies uh but um <laughs> tell yeah, us how you really you feel. would be <sighs> so you really um yeah i just should just stick to doing awesome tv shows and uh well bradley i don't know why you had to remake the star is born <laughs> i'll stick with the judy garland classic <laughs> um after wasting my time in that annoying movie um so i, I just it's didn't interesting. watch it yeah, that, that's definitely the way to go. A star is bored. Um, so, but this movie was not boring in that. Uh, I mean, if you did it nowadays, I think the actors would just, you would just go, oh, yeah, so and so. It would just be a name drop game instead of, did they actually contribute anything to the movie, you know? Like, that's how I felt like with the sequel to Horrible Bosses, where it's like, 
they added so many other people to the cast who did nothing in the entire runtime. And it's like this one, everybody had something to do, even if you didn't realize what what their connection was to everything right away, you know? So, like, you go the whole movie not seeing James Earl Jones till the very end, and that's even more powerful because now you want to rewatch the movie and see where they might possibly name drop him initially, <laughs> hint at him. Because yeah. originally you think, okay, Ben Kingsley, he's known for playing villains. Yeah, he's just the only main bad. And it's like, no, he's he even indicates beforehand. It's like, I'm, you know, if I have my way, you know, I'll do it this way. <laughs> and he's always acting like he even answers to someone other than himself, if you just notice his body language. So, I mean, th- th- there's, it- it's just a great puzzle, just putting back, together and then just tearing apart when you got to put it back in the box you know <laughs> just the jigsaw <laughs> and, right the the people pu- the people puzzle pieces do all fit in uh, absolutely cosmo yeah i mean he he a lot of uh scenes in this movie are two people on screen talking right even the henchmen get some great roles i love it when he's like you you trusted us that was your mistake but he says it also just in a way where it's like it's not just so obvious. It's like, it, again, David Mamet and Aaron Sorkin probably wish they wrote this far in the movie. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. If they if you got too wordy with this, it would just be just fucking stupid. It'd just be like, why are they talking that way? So, uh, I I really do like how like you say it's like every character talks to so and so, and it's not. Uh, like today's age where they have to just be a stunt casting or or be dead by the end of their scene. They, they actually are just all just kind of they're w- all part of the same organization. And it is actually kind of funny how the NSA guys are kind of uh, subtle at first and then lose their shit on the guys who are, you know, are our main heroes, anti-heroes technically. And they're all just laid back and just being since they have the high ground at that point, they're just flat out just, they're just told being wise asses with everybody. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to kiss Chain a little more <laughs> before I, and then I'm going to make sure he at least kisses my ass before I give him what he wants. So <laughs> and it's just, it, it's a very beautiful movie <laughs> and it is definitely very well shot. Uh, who was the cinematographer is John Linley. Who also worked with Robinson on Field of Dreams and Some of All Fears. Good job. He also shot the 87 horror film The Stepfather. So there you go. Was elected last year to the president of the International Cinematographers Guild. Man, I love this guy's. <laughs> I really like how this is shot. I mean, it's pretty. But it's also at times even just gloomy, gritty, before you even realize that it's gritty. <laughs> but it, I mean, it brings you into the dark room with them is one of the things right. that I like about that. Oh, absolutely. There's no other way to do it either. I mean, it had to be done that way because, I mean, it, you had to... There's time. There's very limited, you know, steady cam, handheld even. And yet there's plenty of other times where it's moving around, but it's not even the typical, you know, dolly shot and no cutaway. It's even more uh, just will trail around and then it'll go in an angle which you didn't even expect it to go in. But it doesn't even restrict itself to the voyeuristic thing because, I mean, they want us to like these guys. <laughs> They're not being voyeurs because they want to be. They're spying and then getting out. And so I like how it's just how he has the kind of on-the-run kind of feel. Don't get too comfortable. We're going to be gone from this location by literally in five minutes. <laughs> we're going to be in the loft. We're going to be in the van. We're going to be in the car, maybe driving through. We're going to be outside and we're going to be in the uh, stairway next to the tunnel, giving an exposition so they can't hear us. <laughs> if we, we were talking about the music and I had seen that the composer was even somebody that I'd heard of James, James Horner. We miss you, buddy. We miss you. So many talented people involved in this movie. Yeah, nowadays, not, not to knock him, but this would just have Hans uh, Zimmer. And it's like he could be reusing a score from one of his other blockbusters and you wouldn't realize it. <laughs> and it's like, no, not, none of that. Like like you say, it does different selection. There's very little percussion from what I noticed. 
even typical kind of drumming and trumpets it, and uh, very rarely does it have music playing while they're talking. And there's even stretches of the movie where there's not, you hear nothing, not even sound effects or any other kind of background foley. And that just gives you the, that just lulls you in even more because you're kind of getting the, the stealth aspect of the movie. And so definitely kudos. I don't know if they figured it out in the editing room before at, or planned it before, but it works. It really does. It just gets you into the movie. It gets you in the mood to think and act like a spy while seeing actual operatives. And, and I do like, again, nowadays, if they did this, half this team would have betrayed one another. You know, it's like, oh, I want the money or something. It would have been just fucking pretentious. It would have just been like, no, 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 no. You're just ripping off, you know, other shows like The Unit or 24 and, and without the characterization or uh, the excellent backstory that lulls us in. is like, uh, these guys, we don't even really know shit about them other than Poitier and Redford. And we even forget at times that they're the leading people, but not in a bad way. And, you know, like, that the movie gives everyone plenty to do and even moments where we don't even realize that they're part of that equation. Oh, I got this, you know, that they'll even admit afterwards. We don't even have to see it, but we feel rewarded. Yeah. Everybody knows their job. Well, exactly. And we know their job without being confused. Like, Oh, I thought he was the snipers. Like, well, no guys, th this is a spy movie with absolutely no need for guns till the very end. And at the end, that's just used as a bargaining chip. That's not used to, you know, shoot their way out so to speak it's all it's all configured it's definitely an unofficial cyberpunk movie a good movie well i don't know if it's a good movie it's a fun movie that i would compare to this would probably be uh playing god i don't know if you ever saw that but that's definitely a cyberpunkish movie okay david Duchovny, timothy hudden young angelina jolie so oh, I, I would be surprised atypical, if I, didn't see it. I like all of those things this is definitely i think even more Mission Impossible than Mission Impossible, and I don't mean that to knock on the show or the movies. Uh, it definitely kind of has a Ronin, you know, the 98 film with De Niro and John Reno. Uh, it, it's definitely the get in, get out. Way more realistic. It, it, But it also doesn't leave the characterization to just the actors, which is what so many movies make a huge mistake. I was like, okay, loose story, just... I mean, it can work for like maybe a man on fire or taken knockoff, but at the end of the day, we also want a reasonable backstory to follow. <laughs> and it was like, and we didn't need someone like uh, Pierce Brosnan or uh, uh, Denzel Washington doing, you know, extra hard labor to <laughs> breathe life into what's not there and re make us debate whether the movie was even good to begin with. And like th this movie is pretty well outlined and uh you know the exposition is really here and there like they know how to just kind of run and gun so to speak they know how to just kind of reveal and then indicate that there's another mystery to part of the reveal and so then you realize okay yeah no this is not atypical this is not you know point a to point b obviously but it's also not uh just five more twists and the movie's done like <laughs> there's there's going to be at least 10 levels to every twist. And again, there's going to, when you watch it every year, there's going to be other parts that you're, you know, by that point, you'll know that they got there, they succeeded, but you also know that it wasn't just clean cut uh, there. And so uh, I, again, uh, it's so rare that a movie puts you in the mind of a spy and it's not just, you know, uh, to everyone else in Hollywood and internationally, it just seems to be, I'd use, you know, grapple hooks and silence pistols. Like, no, this is, I spy on people using the gadgets and then, uh, you know, I use my next move and then I dig up another blueprint. Then I wait it out. I observe a location and we figure out how we're going to break into that. And then uh, this movie also does a good job of just, again, just so much of what's off screen you just get it in your head of how they got in there. And then that makes you again, want to rewatch the movie and indicate where they would have probably done whatever heist or infiltration and uh, just mixing spy tropes with heist tropes. It's just always a good thing. I think it's better for any movie. It's typical to insert genres, but I think it's good to s 
combined subgenres as well. It, you're just all the better for it because, I mean, we've seen drama and action, but have you seen, you know, a political thriller mixed with, you know, an action heist movie? So it's like, uh, the, but to avoid being redundant or repetitive here, I, I think uh, this also does good at just uh, the humor is there to characterize the guys. And you kind of get a sense that, you know, they made a mistake. They weren't perfect, but they also weren't, uh, you know, it's not like they were using the spy technology for just absolutely unethical stuff to get rich or, you know, abuse people or other privileges. They were just flat out. They they laundered some money for a political cause. And then they uh, also end up using uh, realizing there's some other abuses and <laughs> um and I love how people are setting them up and they just basically, uh, you know, they're not going to stand for that. And I love there how uh, when the people are killed at the it's very dark, probably the darkest scene in the movie was when the limo driver and the bodyguard disposed of and they're trying to frame Redford for it. It's like, man, it's like not graphic or anything, but it is also just just like. So that's a key plot point. <laughs> it's like something that's going to come from a high source. And of course they'll trust it and he'll instantly have another manhunt issued for him. So doesn't he, it's definitely like Grand Theft Auto where the heat is on. You know? <laughs> um, and I, I think video game movies could definitely learn from something for this. If you're going to do a Splinter Cell movie, make it like this one, please. They won't. <laughs> We can always try. Put it out there into the world. Right. And Tom Clancy's dead, so you don't need him going over your shoulder. <laughs> um, yeah, th- this was... And anyone who said no one will see a movie like this, bullshit. This, in 90s dollars, made $23 million, gained back $105.2 million, So, um, yeah, that's a hit. <laughs> that's a big-ass hit. So... Um, I think what's also works uh, truly well is every scene is not even over edited and yet it it never gets boring. Even seeing that they're in a very uh, just limited locations like that next thing, you know, they're in a totally different place somewhere, somehow. And uh, I think most movies just somehow they, they don't know how to build up any kind of suspense typically and actually make the invisible details that are in your head actually fascinating because <laughs> either what's on screen isn't that fascinating or it falls victim to just very uninspired dialogue and i think it also helps that what they're saying isn't even any typical kind of stuff like run hide fight you know it's not even shit like that it's all just more of like did you get this disc oh yeah the disc that contains this and uh, it'll either be enthusiastic or sarcastic, which is definitely a great way to not only characterize people, but also entertain us, the viewers, with some amusing dialogue. <laughs> so uh, it's just a win-win for everybody, really. I mean, the actors all had something to bite into. The script was gripping enough. And uh, the movie, I mean, it looks similar visually to stuff like Hunt for October, but you can't call it a Hunt for October knockoff. Cause I mean, aside from setting and no submarines, I mean, there's just not no comparison. It's just a very well done, uh, spy caper film. And, uh, the genre mashup is not only just inspired, but also makes use of it instead of saying, ah, oh, they got so close and they could have done this and that with this. And, just when you think, oh, other actors aren't going to get as much screen time, they do configure into the rest of the thing. And so then, again, you want to see, uh, imagine your head how they were probably prepping for that final ambush. It's even action-packed, even when you're not even seeing any kind of action. I mean, I, I want to know what that toy company heist was like. <laughs> what kind of crappy, you know, stuff they had to go through. <laughs> We're talking about making the plan after getting the intel, they... They practiced in their loft for the the motion sensors. They dedicate one section the right there. Yeah, yeah, the thermo. But I, I just love how he just shows everything he ga- gathered. 
he didn't have time to have it be a perfect thing. It's just a giant ass trash bag. And they're all like, I think one of them just yells search. And they all just jump right on in. <laughs> yeah. Or Scatter. when things start to go to shit, they say battle stations and everybody goes to their spot in the van and gets doing the thing. Yeah. Yeah. They, they need to do it is. Yeah. It is a fun movie and not too hard to find. Yeah. I mean, the world is basically all gray, and it only gets uglier, uglier. The more you find out, the more you wish you hadn't heard, you end up hearing. As a spy, you hear everything. <laughs> the world's pretty depressing. <laughs> so, I mean, I love how they'll often just kind of just make other remarks, like, oh, this isn't as bad as this other mission we had to do. <laughs> you know, just like, I've seen worse. <laughs> I could be dead right now, and you wouldn't even know. <laughs> oh, we've never been to Europe together. You would not know. So... I was right. over there doing all sorts of shit when I was in the CIA. <laughs> Tahiti is not in Europe. <laughs> and Russia, the Russian consulate guys are kind of wild. Greg. But I, but I like how even though this mentions the Cold War, you know they're not the bad guys. It's like not truly the bad guys. And uh, I mean, it's so rare for a Hollywood picture to be that way. It, everything has to be just some Russian or some separatist or you know, the communists now, nowadays communists because how dare you be a communist and and it's got to be some other kind of german separatist or brazilian bomber nowadays so yeah i mean they're getting desperate <laughs> it's got to be in a country that doesn't have any issues but we're going to paint it as that before we link it all to some crooked american senator just to balance it out but yeah here is like and it, CIA and other NSA uh, rejects against the NSA. That's all it is. So um, it's conveniently, you know, convoluted to everybody. Because, I mean, there's a, I think even Cosmo mentions uh, there's stuff I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, he's still working for those guys that faked his death so he could get out of prison. He's the money launderer, and how they explain everything is pretty good. I like how they they both show and talk while they're displaying it. And much like any Alan J. Pacula film, Presumed Innocent is a good example, in my opinion. It just it sh They do good use of just the gaffers on this, just making it more mysterious without making it be too dark or too oversaturated with light. And to make it be just as part of the mood and in a character in its own right, much like the characters. And it's just always good in a movie because there's so nowadays, if they did this, everything would be lens flare. <laughs> it's like, Holy <laughs> shit. Why did I get the Blu-ray when it's already way too fucking bright? So it's like, you would have stuff like that. And this movie is just good at just, again, just walk and talk, but not even West wing style. It's more just like, Basically, they, they, they place you in the scene and they'll have a few other key close-ups. And then for the other great reveal, they go to a whole different other place and actually show you it. And uh, it's also just so rare that you do a heist movie. It's not even just about the box anymore. There's all just five other indicators to it. And midway through the stuff, there's always something else that comes up. But it didn't even require you know a casualty or something else. It's always like... Uh, again, you know, pl go to plan F, plan B, and C are fucked. Uh, and we're going to have to thank our way out of this. <laughs> and it's like, oh, don't humor me. We've seen worse. <laughs> so much worse. Um, the FBI has a very minor presence in this. Um, and it is wild how, yeah, they're just people posing as FBI. So that's kind of a fun portion. It, it just shows he's like, uh, the FBI doesn't know shit about this. <laughs> Guys, this is beyond your pay grade. <laughs> yeah, this is the NSA and the Mafia and former KGB. Right. Uh, uh, what they know, that they definitely know. No, no one else knows this or can even connect the dots to anything close to that magnitude. <laughs> yeah, the FBI is too busy finding ways to fight, you know, again, uh, stuff that's not worthy of their time or uh, experience or... Uh, help local law enforcement double down on drugs technically uh, before and after this. <laughs> so uh, 60, if, if it's said in 69, I mean, you're seeing, 
it, I, I love how it gives kind of a timelessness to this whole thing. Like this could probably happen now, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like it's not very even historical uh, specific. There are random things, you know, they're talking about taking Nixon's money and or the in the Republican present day. Party money. I mean, yeah. And I then there's that even... one poster of uh, George Bush, George H.W. Bush. Yeah, it's the only giveaway uh, setting wise. But I mean, I, I barely I don't think I even saw to uh, they were mostly using, you know, regular, you know, home phones as opposed to actual pagers. So, yeah, it, 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 which is good. They they leaned into technology in the the hacking, the spy gear and everything else was just kind of walkie talkies and splicing yeah. wires. Splicing wires was a good add on uh, the headsets. Um, and I love how anything can be a weapon, whether it's the knowledge or the just ramming your vehicle that has nothing inside it. You know, it's <laughs> like everyone is a distraction. And it's like, yeah, these guys are just more pros and they just kicked all these assholes in the f face in every which place it is like, man, I mean, they flat out, uh, you know, they've been doing it long enough so you can believe it. <laughs> and uh, they you make use of the term freak you know, for Whistler, which is, you know, culture of people who study, explore telecommunications. Yeah. <laughs> 30 something counts <laughs> it is wild to recall it's like yeah he's blind and so that's just so funny when redford's telling him my right my right <laughs> we could probably go on but is there anything that you haven't said about this movie uh, what i have not said uh no thank you ever so much for just uh, letting me uh, help you sum it up um yeah i, I don't think this will ever be I can't even think of a single person who hates this movie, <laughs> to be honest. There's always one. There's always one person that wants to ruin the butt, ruin the, everybody's good time by talking shit about sneakers. Oh, someone uh, in the New York Times gave it a negative review. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? He calls this movie feeble plot wise, resulting in jokey without being funny. <sighs> no, it's funny, but it's not. It doesn't have to be ha ha ha. <laughs> Breathless, without creating suspense. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this whole movie was suspense. What they don't show you. <laughs> it's creating a mood, and then you finally know in the last 20 minutes what's going on. Jesus. <laughs> I think people need to re read up on their terminology. Oh, right. That's the one that said that Portier and Redford were too old? <sighs> That's the whole point. They're veterans. In with the new blood. <laughs> yeah, I mean Carl's nineteen in the in the movie. What did you say? He's twenty two. The River. Yeah, uh, yeah, tech. Yeah, technically, actor wise, yeah. But it's like, yeah, they, you got the kid, you got the blind guy who's restricted to just doing the tech in the van and listening, and then you got yeah, Ackroyd who's middle aged. <laughs> and it's like that's the perfect combo. You have. All ha old habits die hard, and they they know the whole game plan. And they, you know, if the kid were to die, they would avenge him. If the other guys would die, the kid would find another way to just kind of get creative and spy on other people. <laughs> Probably fail because he wouldn't have other backup. But it would be also an interesting movie. <laughs> but it's like they you can follow any of these characters around, and there's some interest level. Yeah, dude. If all of these fuckers died, and it was just the blind guy. He would just find a way to somehow walk his way to a phone and probably leak it to a magazine. We had that cool, cool Braille reader on his computer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, did you remember the segment where it's like they it's like the only visual effects in the entire movie is like it did some cool kind of morph kind of thing. Where? It's like somewhere in one of the hacking segments. Oh, if okay. I'm recalling. It did some kind of cool kind of transition and where it's like it, it layered it all to where it was readable text or some shit like that. Yes, yes. The, it's all the the zeros and ones. <laughs> and then they, yeah, they poke it with uh, one of his 
devices and it just <laughs> what air traffic control, the Federal Reserve, the power grid. And that that <laughs> that was the first of two or three times where Redford just says loudly the thing the person before him said. This one was turn it off. He did it one or two other places <laughs> in the movie, but You're right. When they're building that tent. And like you were talking about with the the call with James Earl Jones on the phone, where it's like, he's lying. It just builds up that tension and then silence. For, right. For the breath. <laughs> See the who... best surprises are not only the ones that you don't expect, but the ones that are just uncommon. And so, yeah, I mean, just from a movie that was, uh, this is its own star. I mean, a. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, everyone's trying to be kind of, they got to borrow from one movie or the other and then add their two cents when they get to that stage. And I mean, this movie just starts just so contrary to any kind of formula. I mean, that's just the joy in and of itself. You you watch it a few different times to figure everything out and you're still going to have like a few things that you might miss because devil's in the details and now you got to plug your shit. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, dominoes are falling. I got to plug my shit. Um, uh, I don't have any reviews for my podcast, but last I checked, uh, Gwen Stefani said, "That's my shit. That's my shit. That my that's my shit." So. Hey, there we go. <laughs> and she ain't no holler back girl. So yes, the Jack Up Review Show can be found on all the podcast formats. We review everything: food, video games, movies, uh, uh, cult shows, and. We do a lot of just kind of blockades where we just review an entire franchise and <sighs> got to finally get the Puppet Master Saga review done, hopefully next week. <laughs> God, that was a lot of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's full moon, so there's ones that you can enjoy for the right reasons, the wrong reasons, and then there's ones that defy even so bad it's good. <laughs> it's just like, man, now, now I, I get to this stage of the franchise and I can't even know if I... I want to determine which one I hated more or which one I hated less. And it's that kind of fun thing. What should have been a gremlins kind of, <laughs> kind of franchise that didn't really evolve into that, but yet still, yeah, you were going to always check it out in the video store one way or the other <laughs> back in the day. Um, yeah. I, I just like going to all these atypical kind of cult franchises, figure out why they're mentioned a lot versus why they're mentioned a little less, you know, was a good idea that was only, uh, that was overblown when it got to movie number two or free, or was it actually a pretty cool franchise and it just flew under the radar because the star power wasn't quite there or it wasn't well advertised. I don't know. And so uh, definitely very much like sneakers where it's, it's just, it's a cult movie, even though, you know, it got the box office and critical praise, but yet, there's still people who you have to introduce to it once in a while and say, hey, 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 how have you not seen this? You've seen Ocean's Eleven? You haven't seen this? This is 011, definitely, of the 92. If, if you've seen past Ocean's 12 and you've not seen Sneakers, reevaluate. I'm definitely going to cover the Ocean's movies because, yeah, I'm, it's just mind-blowing how good Ocean's 13 and 8 are, and yet Ocean's 12 is the running apple that you can watch, but you don't really know what to make of it. <laughs> Thank you for having me on here. Thank you for being with me. It was on a here. blast. Well, oh. if there yeah. is, I have, I don't always do this, but if there is a piece of advice you gleaned from the characters of sneakers that you would put out there as the parting fortune cookie or the parting whatever, fortune cookie, uh, uh, sensei's Redford and, uh, Pointier pointed out to me that don't even trust what you trust. Everyone does the whole trust no one or don't trust this. It's like, no, fuck that. The information that the information that you conjure up won't even be relevant in like five hours because <laughs> you will have a whole big minotaur maze uh, resting for you. Then <laughs> it's just like it, nothing is going to be completely coherent. And so it's your job to just kind of Keep pacing yourself. Damn the man, save the empire. But somebody's doing the good work at the end of the movie. I uh, hope. Do, doing what they started out doing. Right. Yeah. They're, all, all those... Uh, all those. Oh, oh, I know. 
when you get a contribution, just don't even question it. As long as no tabloid says that I got it from this dirty organization, I'm not going to question that. <laughs> just call yourself a super pack and it's dark money. Don't forget to duck and cover everybody. And give him head whenever he wants. Give him head. Help. He did what we all must learn to do. You. And you. And you. And you. Yep. And cover.